I am asking for every pro-Trump patriot watching this video to click the link below and chip in today. My campaign would be nothing without your support. We're doing phenomenally well in fundraising and in the polls. We're leading every single poll against crooked Joe Biden. We have to win. Your support is the only reason we're leading, and it will be your support that will lead us to victory. We have to have victory. If we don't, our country is finished. And if we do, we will make America bring it to a level that nobody has ever seen before. We will make America great again, and we will make it better than ever before. Thank you very much. Well, look, you know, I'm fighting for the Constitution. I'm fighting for the same thing that you three. I watch you all the time, and same thing that you do. You fight for freedom. You fight for your country. Uh, these people are sick. They're sick. They're deranged. Uh, you know, I talk about uh, the enemy on the outside and the enemy from within. So you have Russia, you have China. But if you have a smart president, you always handle him quite easily, actually. We have a lot of advantages. But the, the enemy from within, they are doing damage to this country. Uh, they want open borders. They want high interest rates. They now want to quadruple your taxes. Quadruple. You know, all my life I watched politics, and it was always like politicians want to lower taxes, not quadruple them. There's a whole sickness going on right now. So uh, we're doing really well. It was a tough venue. We tried to get out of the venue. We tried to get out of the judge. But uh, we tried to get out of both. Wouldn't even think about it. So we had probably maybe the worst area in the whole country for me, you know, in terms of vote. I'm sure if I sat down and explained it to that section of the world, we could probably make progress. But uh, one of the worst sections. And they always bring them in these sections, you know, D.C., there, places where Republicans, not just me, Republicans get, like, virtually no votes. But uh, the good news is that I think we've set a record beyond all records for fundraising. That's like a poll. And another one just came out just before I got in that we're six points higher than we were before. So I don't know if that holds up. I mean, I'm just not sure. But people get it. It's a scam. And the Republican Party is really uh, — they've stuck. They stick together in this. They, they see what's — it's weaponization of the Justice Department, of the FBI. And, you know, that's all coming out of Washington. You may think it's uh, — you may think it's brag. Uh, take a look at who opened the case. I'm not allowed to talk about it because I have a gag order. I'm probably, I guess, the first uh, presidential nominee and the leader, the lead leading crooked Joe by a lot, that's not allowed to talk. Maybe they're doing me a big favor. Who knows? <laughs> but I'm not allowed to talk. I'm gagged. Nobody's ever heard of it. It's all coming out. It's weaponization, and it's a very dangerous thing. We've never had that in this country. They do have it in other countries, in South American countries. You know a little bit about it, right? Yeah. Well, th th that actually leads me to my question. I think for a lot of Americans, what's happened to you feels foreign. Like, this has never happened here before. Yeah. But for Hispanic Americans, people coming from Latin America, this feels very familiar. Yeah. And in those countries, people are imprisoned. Um, you know, instead of going to the ballot box and fighting there, they're on house arrest. They're told they can't run for office. Um, what is your message? And, and by the way, I think a lot of Hispanic Americans, I hear from them, they're scared yeah. about what they see. What's your message to them um, about what happened to you and about how scared they are that our country is turning into the countries that they left behind, the corrupt, dysfunctional yeah. countries they left behind. And they are scared, and they're great people, and very entrepreneurial, great energy. And as you know, I'm doing very well with them. I mean, beyond anybody, I don't think anybody's ever had polling. Do you think polling. this is why, a little bit? I think a little bit. And they've always uh, liked me, and I've always liked them. You know, I've done well from the beginning. In 2016, I won the entire border along Texas, and they're all, like, 85 percent. And uh, it's been great from the beginning, and now I'm leading. I think I'm leading over this guy, this guy that can't put two sentences together that's destroying our country. Look, he's the worst president in the history of this country, and he's a danger to the country. And, you know, they have misinformation. Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. It's just words. He doesn't even know what it means. But it's like their slogan, I'm a threat to democracy. I'm the opposite. They're the threat to democracy. Mr. President, I want to return to the verdict, and I want to explore something you said several times already in the conversation. You've referenced these people. I'm sure you've seen the video of yes. Joe Biden when he was asked about the verdict, and he gave sort of a smirk to terrible, the camera. Terrible, terrible. Remember, Bragg didn't want to do the case. He came out. He said, there's no case. And how can you have a witness like so-and-so? I'm not allowed to mention the name. Can you believe this? This guy's allowed to have shows, television shows. I'm not allowed to mention the name. It's so unfair. But regardless, you know, you have to 
you have to really play the hand that you're dealt. And then you had a jury that was, you know, from a certain persuasion. Would have been hard to do, no matter what. But uh, I did absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, absolutely think of it. You know, I hate what they say, a bookkeeping, this and that. It's not. It's called, think of it, expense. I use the word expense. Legal expense. I pay a lawyer. He wasn't a fixer. He was, he was a lawyer at the time. I pay a lawyer, and he's a lawyer. It's called legal expense. A bookkeeper, without ever speaking to me, because she did the right thing, who's been with me for years, marks it down as legal expense. In other words, I paid a legal expense. It's marked down as a legal expense. And they say, that's a fraud. What am I going to call it? Did you ever see a ledger? Do you ever study accounting? The line's like about an inch long and an eighth of an inch wide. You can't write the story. But there is no story. If you pay a legal expense and you write it down as a legal expense, and then they indict you and they go to a grand jury, and they don't use Bob Casella's testimony, you know, they use almost none of it. They, they didn't want him before the grand jury because he's very persuasive. This judge didn't want him to talk. They shouldn't have allowed certain people to testify. It was totally wrong that they did that. So everyone tells me this is the easiest case they've ever seen to overturn, but they don't care because they want to last till after the election. Now, the only problem they have is that so far my poll numbers have gone up. You explain this to me because I don't. Pete maybe can explain it. I maybe will. I don't know. Maybe we'll get. They're smart in Texas, right? But, but the poll numbers have gone up mm -hmm. substantially. I don't know if that's going to remain that way. You changed your tone at some point during the trial. I would say maybe a bit more hopeful in the beginning, and then towards the end, you said something to the effect of even Mother Teresa couldn't be acquitted in this venue. Was there a moment in the trial that you felt like it turned or you saw that it was headed in a certain direction? Well, when you object to something, your lawyers object, good lawyers, professional lawyers, good records, nice people. You know, I've had, I've had a lot of lawyers that weren't nice, and sometimes you're better off that way. These are, fi these are really fine people. They'd object. Uh, not accepted, not accepted, not accepted. When the government, meaning the DA, Bragg, when he said something, uh, all right, good, that's fine. Go ahead, more, more, more. But the, the main thing is this, that this was turned down by the Southern District. This is over years. This could have been brought seven years ago. You know, they tried to rush it because they wanted it before the election. But this could have been brought seven years ago, but they didn't have any intention. A case like this has never been brought before. And there's never been a case where a state has gone after a federal election. In other words, that's for a federal. That's for, like, the Southern District to go. Southern District turned it down. We got clearance from the FEC, Federal Election Commission, clearance. They're suing, saying we violated a thing, but they gave us clearance. But the charge was written. I mean, it was like a weird charge. Uh, you'd have a little of this, a little of that, do a little of this, throw a little, mix it up. You'd set the, uh, the arraignment date for four days before the RNC. Yeah, well, that's part of the game. It, it is. Uh, some have suggested you could appeal straight to the Supreme Court because of the yeah. special nature of this case. Um, when it comes to the legal maze that you're still facing, and yeah. they could, the judge could decide to say, hey, house arrest or even jail. It could. How do you face it could. what that could look I'm like? okay with it. I saw... One of my lawyers the other day on television saying, oh, no, you don't want to do that to the press. I said, don't, you don't beg for anything. You just, the way it is. Think of it. They have all my books. You know, they went to, for five years, they sued me getting my tax returns, right? At the end of five years, they got them. The Supreme Court actually gave it to them. That was the end of it. That was it. They never found anything. They hired the best accounting firms. I have I had a, a pure gold firm. They call it a gold-rated firm. I don't know it's supposed to be. Who knows? But with all that stuff, for years you heard about yeah. my tax. They, they never looked into the Clinton Foundation. And they never found it. <laughs> they never went all the way with the Clinton yeah. Foundation. They never went all the way with the Clinton Foundation, yeah. which is sort of interesting, isn't it? But um, so that could happen. I don't know that the public would stand it, you know. I don't, I'm not sure the public would stand for it. Uh, with a, uh, house arrest or, or I think I think it would be tough for the public to take. You know, at a certain point, there's a breaking point. People ask you, why do you do this? How can you do this? I mean, not to mention the rally after rally, the energy. But maybe the question isn't how do you do this over and over, but how does your family do this? All the obstacles. All, you know, these are these are things you care about. Your ambitions for the country. What about everybody around you? So I think in many ways it's tougher on them than it is on me. They're good people, all of them, everyone, everyone. Uh, 
I have a wonderful wife who has to listen to this stuff all the time. They do that for this reason. They do that. All these salacious names that they put in of these people. And I'm not even allowed to defend myself because of a gag order. Think of it. But they put this stuff in to create havoc. These are bad people. I know everything they're doing. I know every move they make. I get it. But a lot of people don't. But. It's tougher. I think it's probably, in many ways, it's tougher on my family than it is in me. You know, How's Melania doing? She's fine, but I think it's very hard for her. I mean, she's fine. But it's, you know, she has to read all this crap. What about Barron? People started to focus on Barron recently. He's, he's amazing, actually, in a certain way. You know, he's tall, good-looking guy. He's a very good student. And uh, he's, he's uh, applied to colleges and gets into everywhere he goes. You know, he's, he's very sought after from the standpoint he's a very smart guy, he's a very tall guy, but he's, and he's a, he's a great kid. He's, he's cool. He's pretty cool, I tell you. You know, it's very interesting, the colleges, you know, six months ago, you look at a college and you sort of want a certain college, and then you see all of these colleges are rioting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you want to go to a different kind of a college, because there's plenty of colleges that we also like that are different, and they don't riot. That's the first part of our interview with, with former President Donald Trump. We'll be playing it throughout the morning. Again, it was an hour and a half interview. That's a 10-minute chunk. Uh, and throughout the morning, we'll be playing different portions. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmeade. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. November's presidential election has implications well beyond our country's borders. And a new piece in The Atlantic entitled What Europe Fears details how European leaders and NATO are preparing for the potential re-election of Donald Trump. And joining us now, the author of that piece, staff writer at The Atlantic, McKay Coppins. McKay, thank you for coming on this morning. So tell us what these leaders are saying. You know, I was struck traveling through Europe and talking to all these leaders by two things. One is that they're watching the U.S. election very, very closely. Thomas Bogger, the state secretary in Germany, actually told me that in a year when billions of people around the world will have the opportunity to vote, the one election everyone in Europe cares about and is paying attention to is the American presidential election. The other thing that struck me is that almost every official I spoke to believed that Donald Trump was going to win again. And they, they say that with a sense of dread, in some cases bordering on panic, honestly. You know, uh, the word that I heard most often in these interviews was existential. They said if Donald Trump comes back, you know, we, we made it through the first Trump term, right? And, and it, it took a toll on the transatlantic relationship, but, but they made it through. They said if he comes back, given what he's been saying about NATO, given what he's been saying about Russia, the war in Ukraine, uh, they're really afraid that it will be the end of NATO and the beginning of a new stage of Russian aggression that Europe, frankly, isn't prepared for without America support. So, McKay, let's dive into that a little bit more. There's been, from President Macron of France in particular, this effort to try to make European more <clears throat> independent, or should we at least say less dependent on the U.S. Uh, in terms of our military and financial strength. What other steps are he and his fellow European leaders taking to try to, if you will, Trump-proof uh, what they're doing right now ahead of his possible return? Yeah, there have been a number of efforts recently uh, proposed. One of them, as you mentioned, is, uh, you know, developing defense autonomy in Europe in a way that would uh, potentially channel funds away from NATO, which really does rely on America and toward the European Defense Alliance. There's been talk of uh, taking the responsibility for arming Ukraine, the lit literal logistical responsibility, out of America's hands and putting that in NATO's hands because they don't know if a future Trump administration would abandon the war or not. Um, and really, the biggest change has been uh, that a lot of European allies are spending a lot more now on their own defense. And this is one thing that, you know, Trump takes credit for. And I have to say, a lot of the European officials I spoke to actually grudgingly gave him some credit for. They said, you know, Trump, by kind of uh, being so vociferous about this issue that European allies aren't spending enough on defense, has sort of bullied a lot of these countries into spending more. But it's come at a cost. And that cost is that the 
these European countries, while they are, are now spending more on collective defense, contributing more to NATO, also don't trust America as a, a long-term ally the way that they have for the last 75 years. And when, when America mm -hmm. becomes an unpredictable power uh, or a transactional power, uh, that changes the entire global order in ways that I don't think we right. can predict right now. Sure does. Well, and, and we, we, we heard uh, back in, I think it was 2018, 2019, Angela Merkel in the Chancellor of Germany saying we can no longer <clears throat> depend on the United States, yeah. basically with Trump, because he's so erratic. We're going to have to defend ourselves. It's something Macron has said as well. So uh, I'd stand me with faint praise, Claire McCaskill, if, if, if Donald Trump's making them spend more money on defense because they're spending more money on defense because they know they can't count on the United States in their minds if Donald Trump is president of the United States. Uh, McKay writes this uh, also that almost every official I spoke with believed that Trump is going to win. And I hear that an awful lot from Europe and I hear it from across the world. I think, Claire, we should probably tell our friends not to bet too many euros or pounds or rubles on that fact because uh, what you see on TV may not be what ends up happening in voting booths for swing voters in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Yeah, those three states particularly um, where really Biden has never been more than a point or two behind and in many polls has been ahead in those three states. And those three states are incredibly important. McKay, I wanted to ask you about the what's going on in Europe domestically in terms of their politics. Um, mm -hmm. We have seen in the United States populism and a, you know, really virulent strand of nationalism, anti-immigration anti that has really roiled our politics here. What What is the happening in that front in Europe? Uh, it looks from a distance that they're having some of the same issues internally within the conservative parties there, the anti-immigration, the populism. I, is that something that Europe is also worried about? Oh, no question. You know, the, the, the fear of Trump's return uh, in Europe is is of a piece with the fear of a broader rise of right-wing populism and nationalism across Europe. We've seen it in the UK, we've seen it in Italy, uh, in Germany, the uh, AFD party, which is the far-right party. There was one recent poll that found that 25% of Germans now identify with that party, and that, that's a pretty extreme party. So there, there's no question that throughout Western democracies, and really in Europe especially, we've seen a lot of the same forces that have contributed to Trump's rise. And so in some ways, the Europeans kind of understand Trump through that prison. Them, right? They're saying, you know, we get it. We have our own issues here. The, some of our, our allies have elected leaders like Donald Trump. But it's different when it happens in America, because America is not only the linchpin uh, of the of NATO alliance, it is in a lot of ways seen as kind of the big brother, right? The, the Euro European countries rely on America for security. They rely on it for leadership. They rely on America to set an example to the world for what a, a well-functioning Western democracy should look like. And a lot of the anxiety about this election uh, in Europe is stems from the fact that they're seeing this kind of chaos in American democracy and wondering if the the city on a hill can still be looked to as an example. And, and, that, and that causes a lot of alarm in our, among our friends in Europe. Whew, the new piece is online now for The Atlantic. Staff writer McKay Coppins, thank you so much for writing the piece and being on the show this morning. Joining us now is Fox News contributor Ben Dominich. Ben, the right doesn't even get it right when it's their turn to bat. You got Brennan and Blackman and Souter and Warren and John Paul Stevens. I mean, those were all, I think, GOP picks. And even recently, Elizabeth Warren's beloved Customer Financial Protection Bureau was saved by justices appointed by Republicans. So. I mean, really, the world's going to end if, if, if another Republican justice gets appointed? 
Look, all these people live in this fantasy world where the Republican justices who are appointed are somehow these abject partisans who can't be counted on to have heterodox opinions on anything. Uh, and of course, as you said there, uh, there have been a number of choices where I feel like uh, past Republican presidents have just gotten it wrong. Look, I, I wish that you could raise the funds to send Sheldon Whitehouse a book on the separa separation of powers. I really doubt that he'd, he'd be able to make his way through it and understand it. Um, but his, he especially can't understand the meaning of the flags hung out uh, side of the Alito home as being anything other than a useful bat to go after these justices with. Th there's one more subtext, though, uh, Trey, and that's that when I listen to Jill Biden complaining, I listen to that as being a complaint directed at Sonia Sotomayor, who, if they actually wanted to, you know, uh, really push to try to make a difference at this point, you know, there are a lot of Democrats who wish that she would have stepped down already, frankly, so that they would have an option to name someone younger to her seat. And so the pressure, I think, to expand the court, to engage in completely ridiculous, unlawful, uh, unconstitutional, uh, and really, you know, anti-balanced uh, anti behavior in terms of, of the way that Democrats have approached this issue, I think that that's definitely going to happen if Democrats are able to win back the White House with Joe Biden and win the Senate as well. You know, Ben, that's a great point, and it's also really rich that Justice Sotomayor is too old, but Jill Biden's husband is not. Uh, I want you and I to do something I never <laughs> thought we'd do together, which is listen to a guy from Chicago lecture us about ethics. Justice Alito is not paying attention to his responsibility to the court and to the American people. He can't play fast and loose with these political symbols without jeopardizing his own integrity. I think the question is, how many MAGA battle flags does a Supreme Court justice have to fly until the rest of the court takes it seriously? She recuse. She recuse. Absolutely. Of course you should. Hey, hey, Ben, if you can keep a secret, I have no idea what flags fly on my front porch. My wife is in charge of all of that. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't tell you which flags fly. I mean, honestly, that's what's on their mind is what flags fly at a Supreme Court justice's house. I mean, that, that, well, what who business gets to define is in either what? one of theirs? Who, who gets to define what a MAGA battle flag is? I remember a couple of years ago when Colin Kaepernick went after Nike for having the Betsy Ross flag. Where I live in an historical area, I see those flags all over the place in an area that's so blue that, I mean, it would, you know, crawl over broken glass to vote for Joe Biden again. It's, it's something that I think is absolutely ridiculous here. It's ahistorical. And when Sheldon Whitehouse says things like that, he knows exactly what he's doing, which is taking American history that should unite us around our founders and around a founding generation that fought a revolution for our freedom. This, this is a flag, you know, in the, in the case of the Appeal to Heaven flag, the pine tree flag, that actually was flying in front of San Francisco City Hall and had for years prior to this whole controversy. Who knew that they were flying a MAGA battle flag all along? <laughs> Apparently, that's something that they needed to correct. But that's with the kind of a historical situation that we're dealing with here, where they will seek out anything to weaponize it against a court that they can't stand has a number of constitutionalists on it. I just find it so rich that they criticize judges uh, like Judge Cannon down in Florida and Supreme Court justices when they don't like the outcome, but then they criticize Republicans who, who even like frown at judicial ruling. So it, the duplicity is even too How much for you? me. And I'm a lawyer, and it's yeah. too much for me. Ben <laughs> Dominich, thank you for joining us on a Sunday night. Good to be with you. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.